Nice to see you all. Um, you're part of the, you're obviously the non-fictional part of the hundred people who've registered for this, um, for this particular event. So it's very nice to see you. Um, I'm just going to do the domestics first of all and outline how this event is going to run. Um, our two stars are going to kick it off uh, with a presentation of this volume here. And uh, it's a very special volume, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and we will then have a couple of discussants uh, of people who've been involved in the book. And we will then have some Q&A. That may take us, I guess, to half past six, perhaps even quarter to seven. We will then invite you to come upstairs and have a drink, something to eat, continue the conversation uh, over some refreshments. Um, if you hear a fire alarm, then it's real. And there's an exit there, and there's an exit out at the front there. Um, uh, I think that's probably all I need to tell you. Um, so I'm going to kick off then with the substantive part of the evening and introduce our two speakers. Uh, it's a very, very special evening for me. Um, I'm uh, the director of the Institute for Sustainable Resources, Paul Eakins. And our two speakers tonight were two of our first PhD students. We were set up in 2011, and they joined us in 2012, and graduated because they're so brilliant all too quickly. Um, and Florian, uh, who's one of the speakers and one of the co-editors of this book, and indeed one of the main authors, uh, went off to the OECD, where he's now part of the Young Professionals Program, working on uh, green growth strategy and environmental accounting. He also has an honorary lectureship here, and we're very happy to see him back here every now and again. Um, the second of our two uh, alumni, two first alumni, is John Rechler, and he's sitting over there. Uh, he left UCL to go off and become an economist at the World Bank, uh, where he's working at the intersection of climate change and sustainable, resilient development. So exactly the kind of thing that I would have hoped uh, graduates of UCL from this particular institute would go off and do, if they're not going to stay here, and obviously we'd be very happy to stay here too. Um, he also has a number of other affiliations, a visiting fellow at the Payne Institute for Earth Resources uh, in Colorado among them, and he's worked as a consultant to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is a significant part of the story because this book is, at least in part, an outcome of a consultancy they, they did at EBRD while they were doing their PhD. So getting a PhD was not enough for them. While they were here, they went off and did this consultancy. And out of that consultancy has come this book because their uh, actual PhD topics were slightly different. That's probably enough. It's an enormous pleasure to see you both back here again. I'm much looking forward to what it is you have to say. Florian and Jim, very welcome. <laughs> Just make sure that it works. Perfect. So, Paul, thank you very much for this uh, excessively kind introduction. We are uh, both of us, I speak on behalf of both of us, but I say we are very glad to be back here uh, to be presenting this work that we did um, while we were here at UCL. Um, it's been a, yeah, it's been a, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. And th thank you to Raymond and Paul for making this all possible for welcoming us back, and great to see you all here. Um, so as Paul mentioned, the work on this uh, topic for us started almost exactly five years ago. Um, we, on the basis of a partnership between our institute and our team here, um, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, also here in London, um, Florian and I started looking into the economic rationale of resource efficiency. and looking at the market failures and the investment barriers that are impeding, progr uh, impeding progress uh, to advancing the agenda of resource efficiency. Um, so as we, and as part of that, we started collaborating over the years with partners in universities, with uh, multilateral uh, financers who uh, work on resource efficiency and finance projects, and uh, we started working with uh, policy organizations. And as we went on, we realized that the story that we were 
converging towards was, uh, was resulting in a bigger picture that we couldn't really find much in the literature on. So at some point we decided that it wouldn't just be a waste of paper to put this all together in a, in a book. Um, so in addition to the eight chapters that Florian and I wrote ourselves, we were fortunate enough to have a range of excellent contributors um, from here, from the Institute, um, but also from um, practitioners, so <coughs> investors, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the European Investment Bank, as well as the European Commission, who all added their perspective on um, the practical implementation side of um, investing in resource efficiency. And Florian will tell you a bit more about the main messages of this book, but before we get to that, I would like to take a step back and talk a bit about why are we actually talking about this topic, why does it matter? Um, so a part of the answer to that question um, we can find here uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, if you, it's one of the poorest countries in the world, one of the most politically fragile countries. Um, if you Google the news items just for last week that came out of DRC, it's Islamist insurgencies, it's um, an outbreak of Ebola in some parts of the country, it's violent street protests in uh, the run-up to the general election in a few weeks, and all of this in a country that has not seen a peaceful transition of power since its independence in 1960. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, DRC also happens to be the world's largest export of cobalt. Um, uh, over two-thirds of the world's supply come from the DRC, and cobalt is a crucial ingredient to producing rechargeable batteries. So in all of your mobile phones, in increasingly in electric vehicles, and so on, you will find um, cobalt possibly from the DRC. So the political uncertainty that you have here is at the same time supply uncertainty for the Apples and the Teslas and all of us um, around the world. Now, all of this is just to illustrate that Natural resources, they are at the intersection of um, uncertain supply, rising demand, and all of that, that we can uh, see reflected in here in the price of metals, for instance. So we see increasing volatility, we see increasing prices. Um, this is partly driven also by increasing financialization of commodity markets that allow very easy <coughs> trading, even by those who don't necessarily need the materials themselves. Now, resource efficiency comes in because it is a hedge against all of these challenges. The less we are dependent on these, um, on these resources, the less exposed we are to, for instance, volatile prices. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals, I, most of you will know about all of these. I don't want to go into detail about all of them, but the goal number 12 recognizes the importance of resource efficiency in circular economy. It's about responsible consumption and production, and it has very vague but it, uh, goals, but it emphasizes the importance of resource efficiency and circular economy. However, what I would like to point out much more than that resource efficiency is reflected in these goals is what we see in all the other SDGs. Um, let's take two examples. Um, affordable clean energy, this goal calls for massive expansion of electrification, uh, especially through renewable energies. So these are the sub-targets under the SDG 7. Then under industry, innovation, and infrastructure, the SDGs call, call for a massive um, expansion of infrastructure provision, but also the industrial production of um, manufacturing, for instance, in developing countries around the world. The point I'm making here is that all of these goals will require a massive increase in the use of natural resources. So one region that has already seen a lot of progress on these goals, so in terms of infrastructure provision, electrification, um, and industrial growth, uh, is Asia. And so there are success stories all across East Asia, Southeast Asia, and we see that when we look at the uh, material resource use graph over the past 
35 years. Um, there has been a massive increase in the use of natural resources. Most of this increase is accounted for by countries in the Asian, um, in the south, especially Southeast Asia and East Asia. Now, what the SDGs are calling for is essentially same kind of development success stories in Africa and countries all across these regions. Now, it doesn't take much to imagine what this graph would look like in 15 years if you continue development with the same hunger for resources as it has happened in Asia. You, what the resource efficiency goal in the SDGs really calls for is to have that same kind of development success story with a lower dependence on material resources. The, what we need for that is increased efficiency and we cannot achieve that if we continue to have the same kind of efficiency gaps that we are observing today. So this is just an example comparing the steel industry in Russia and the EU. To produce one ton of steel, Russian steel companies use three, three times more energy, almost four times more sand, and 160 times more water than the average European uh, steel company. So if we continue to have these efficiency gaps, as we call it here, we will not be able to have sustainable um, growth in many developing countries because simply the hunger for resources will be too large. So what, we're, what we ask in this context is what does it take to, take to close this efficiency gap? Where, uh, who are the main actors? Uh, what are the main barriers to doing so? And what are the approaches and methodologies, policy approaches that we need to take in order to make sure that we make sure that this efficiency gap is closed and we make progress along this um, SDG 7 or the resource efficiency agenda. So this is where our book comes in and Florian will now take us through the main messages. Yes, thank you very much uh, June and also thank you uh, Paul of course for the, for the introduction. It's great to be back here. So against this uh, you know, backdrop of what June described as like the, the challenges I had essentially, yes, we asked the question, uh, the questions what resource efficiency uh, can deliver, what it cannot deliver, and what, uh, what the role of investments uh, can play in this. So um, just to run you through uh, the, the book and the structure of the book, it's uh, essentially structured in four thematic pillars. Um, the first one is about background and, and concepts, and uh, this is about uh, concepts, definitions, and trends. Uh, Stein, who is in the audience, uh, also wrote a chapter on this uh, thematic pillar. And essentially, the outcome of this is that, uh, well, progress is insufficient, right? I mean, this is exactly what uh, June already described. Uh, the second thematic pillar is about methodologies and evidence. Um, and here it's really uh, like a, a vast source of uh, so barriers to resource efficiency investments, uh, also a cost-benefit framework that really stresses that the cost of inaction is, is very important to take into consideration. Um, then there is some empirical evidence also on that the benefits of resource efficiency are heterogeneously distributed across uh, countries and firms. Um, and there's also something Ryman will, will talk about uh, later on on transformations and disruptive uh, changes. The third thematic pillar is about case studies and practitioners' insights. So each of these, uh, well, you might have figured already, like each of these uh, rectangles represents one chapter. So, um, and here really it's about the experience that the European Investment Bank, but also European Bank for Reconstruction and Development brings in. And um, also something about the EU uh, resource efficiency and circular economy agenda. Uh, and here it's really the importance that comes up of here is um, that these projects need to be or become commercially viable. Um, and and that's, that's a very important uh, finding here. And it also show, showcases that uh, this is possible at least uh, for some um, investment projects. The fourth is the basic pillar is about policy implications and conclusions. Uh, and uh, Paul will also say something about this. And this is really about the, the importance of, of what policy can provide uh, within, uh, within this topic. And, and that policy can play a crucial role in bringing about uh, this resource transition. So the move to 
about some more uh, resource efficient circular economy. So this is just to, to give you, you know, some idea of how the book is being structured. Um, but there are essentially three main messages that I would like to talk to you uh, through now. The first key message is that increasing resource efficiency requires action on the ground. So the current narrative, how this topic is being uh, portrayed at the moment is that uh, while resource efficiency uh, provides or promises economic, environmental, and strategic benefits, exactly responding to the challenges that June described. Um, and in order to implement these, uh, there are high-level national and international strategies, among them the SDGs already mentioned. You also have on the EU basis uh, the resource efficiency and circular economy agenda, um, but you also have it on the national basis, of course. And they do provide an important, especially also monitoring framework um, uh, for the resource uh, uh, transition, but they are quite high level, right? Um, and there seems to be a mismatch between these high level approaches, but in the end it really comes down to decentralized decision making by firms and individuals to implement it. And this is, this is really, there seems to be a gap between these two. And so what we propose is to, uh, well, first of all, be practical. <laughs> but the second is to create feedback loops so that these high-level agenda are basically broken down to what does that mean for a specific country, for a specific sector, or even for specific firms to understand what is possible on the ground to be implemented at the moment, what is possible in the future. And then basically create this link of feeding back this information to the high-level policies uh, to make them uh, more realistic um, and also to have a more bottom-up approach uh, in this. So this is basically this feedback loop that is currently lacking. There are a few ideas of how you can do that. There are also a few uh, different agendas. The SDG agenda, the IPCC agenda has some ideas uh, to, to start with. But this is essentially lacking at the moment. The key message number two is that significant investment barriers exist and impede progress. And now there are investments that are not profitable, even if there would be no barrier. I mean, these would not be taken up. There are, however, projects that are uh, basically beneficial, even though there are barriers, they are taken up as well. And so the focus here is on those investment projects that are not beneficial at the moment or commercially viable at the moment because of barriers. And these barriers, constitute a, a web of constraint um, and opportunity costs also determine exactly whether or not uh, investment decisions are being taken up. And this could be a lack of internalizing externalities, it could be high upfront costs, it could be uh, you know, that the, the benefits are, are long term, so only uh, payback times are, are quite uh, large or long. And essentially, there are two entry points into this. You can either address the symptoms, so if the you know, firm lacks, uh, let's say, um, finance for a particular project, you could provide this, or you could go to the structural causes. So these are structural inefficiencies, uh, such as uh, market, more, more structural market failures that could be addressed um, as well. And what we also see and what we can show is that um, basically these investment projects um, increase their commercial viability when externalities are taken into account, the cost of inaction is taken into account, and longer time horizons are considered. Well, and this is exactly where public policy can play a role. Then also some hands-on hands -on experience shows us that um, well, the, com uh, the importance of commercial viability, of course, and attracting uh, private finance, which is required to bring about these changes that uh, June also described, um, and to achieve progress at scale. And this is really the part, right? Like for individual projects, you might be able to do it, but you have to do it on, on a large scale. And this is, uh, this is crucial. And then there's also the, the role of public private risk sharing, of course. And, and there, you have to, f you really struck a balance between. Uh, taking over risk from a public side because taking up too many risks is also not what you want to do, especially if the benefits are privatized, but you kind of take up the, the risk yourself as a public entity. Um, but at the same time, it can incentivize investments. Um, and there are also some new ways for financing 
circular business models that can play a key role uh, here. And then the third key message is that the resource transition requires carefully designed policy packages. And I mean, this makes sense because it's, a, it's, a, it's such a, you know, a wide reaching uh, topic that really goes you know, from economic policy, trade policy, education policy, uh, environmental policy, um, uh, energy policy, and so on. So it really, it's, it's a broad spectrum um, of different uh, policy domains that uh, needs to be integrated into a holistic approach. And um, that means also mainstreaming, of course, uh, the, the investment uh, part of the sustainable development agenda and vice versa. And this is really key here, and this would be really interesting also to discuss with you tonight, um, is that um, basically the, the current narrative, as I described previously, is about a win-win situation, right? So resource efficiency is great, um, but what does it mean become, becoming resource efficient? And this is a transition, and this is why we talk about a resource transition. And within that transition, as in every transition, there are our adjustment costs, right? There are structural changes within our economies. And those adjustments uh, can create winners and losers. And it's very important to underpin these policy packages by a social dimension. Because frankly speaking, we cannot tell people that everything is going to be all right when in the end they might lose their job and then they turn against the very institutions that, uh, that propagated this. So, we can draw lessons from those adjustments that worked well and those that didn't work well and learn from those that didn't work well um, that can help mitigate the social economic um, uh, implications and also to support local economies, um, countries, regions, skill sets, you know, we're talking here uh, about, about these items, um, also through resource efficiency and circular economy activities. And this is important because this is, in a way, how we can sustain public support for these policies. So the book, of course, there's a lot more detail in the book, but and it tries to answer several questions, uh, and we believe it does. But at the same time, it also raises a lot of new questions. And so this institute here, but also the audience here, is, uh, is quite well suited to to think about them and, and ideally close these gaps as well. Um, so what would be important to, to better understand is, uh, is really that empirical research takes into consideration these socioeconomic implications. So we need to much better identify those countries, sectors, region, um, uh, firms, uh, and, and, and skill sets that might be negatively affected by this transition. We also need to much better understand how we design policy, uh, policies uh, that take into consideration um, trade-offs. Um, and just to name two, one trade-off being uh, the competitiveness side of things. The other one is also, of course, the, the climate goals. What we also need to uh, better understand is, is how we can create this enabling environment for investments, especially long-term and high-risk investments, in these disruptive eco-innovations. And th this is really crucial because you know, innovation is already tricky and, and it needs a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to come together. Eco-innovation, so taking the environmental side additionally into account, uh, creates an even, even bigger challenge. And also how we can, from a political economy side, uh, build international support for carbon prices, landfill taxation, I mean, in the UK, that's a good example of course, but on an international basis. And this goes also back, of course, to the <coughs> competitiveness um, issue I, I talked in previously. So there's a lot more, of course, in the book, so just buy it, <laughs> of course. Um, this is a, a nice propaganda way of, of incentivizing you to, uh, to, to get it. Uh, we are very much looking forward to the discussion with you. Um, and uh, yes, again, thanks uh, for, for providing us this opportunity to come back here. Uh, there will also be a few interventions now coming up, so before the discussion, we are very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Florian and June. And we're going to move straight on with a few interventions.
So I'm going to ask Ronald Meischwitz, who uh, is now director of the Bartlett School for Environment, Energy, and Resources, um, and was indeed the principal PhD supervisor of both these, uh, both these stars. And then we'll have move straight on to Peter Hirsch, whom I don't know, but there he is. He's very nice to see you there. Okay. You have noticed his name from EBRD, his name under one of the chapters. And then I'm going to share a few thoughts with you on the policy side, and then we'll go into some uh, some questions. Right. Well, thanks, Paul. Uh, well, thanks, June and Florian, indeed. And good evening, everybody. I typically really introduce myself with my day-to-day -day job, which is director of this year, and then I was like deputy director. But today, I'm really pleased to be here in a slightly different function, which has been the proud supervisor of those two guys. So it's really terrific to see that people finish a PhD in time with a brilliant PhD and then move on and then manage to produce a book and they even invite me to make a contribution. So the sort of short intervention I thought I should do is to more or less praise the two, but give you a, a short flashlight on the paper that I uh, could contribute to this eminently valuable book. So we started listening to June and Florian, and maybe some of you got the idea that there is something to earn, to pick up as a bill on the sidewalk as the resource efficiency gain. And you will probably think that it might have been overlooked in the past. So we scratch a bit here and there and bring our smart engineers into a company and then hopefully we will see some 5, 10, 15 percent efficiency gains in the short run. But then, what happens afterwards? Is there a long-term prospect for resource efficiency that might reach beyond the year 2030 when the SDGs ought to be delivered? Is there something in it for countries that currently make a living out of exporting commodities rather than being smart in using those resources? Is it a win for the OECD countries, as in the way evidenced by this slightly suspicious quote, but nothing or not that much for the developing countries eventually? And my statement is no. It's slightly better. And the two points I'm making in the contribution are related to what is called the saturation effect, and the other one is related to the resource nexus. And both are related to like short and long-term strategy on resource productivity. So saturation effect, what is it? When we look at resource efficiency data and time series, we quite often have a time series from 1990 onwards. And when we think back, that probably a number of countries have actually done resource efficiency before, but there's a lack of data. And indeed the point to take here is that most people most countries set up a physical infrastructure. You look around in the UK. This has happened like 100, 150 years ago. And it was more or less ending around the Second World War here. And that's the development story of most industrialized nations. So countries go through what has been labeled as a uh, material environmental customs curve over the decades of their development. And when you do the data analytics, and we are more or less quoting from the paper that in the meantime has been published in Global Environmental Change here. So we look at the per capita consumption, consumption not production, of key materials. We realize that yes, there is this uh, inverted U-shaped curve for in particular steel, but also for cement, for copper, a bit less so for aluminum. And the implication is striking. When we look at China in particular, China is more or less at the top of the expected demand for a number of key materials. So when we look forward, and I'm referring here to the slide we have seen on the hunger for natural resources, we would not necessarily expect China, and probably also not other emerging new economies, to continue having this insatiable demand for natural resources 
as they used to have it in the last 20 years. So this then gives a, a tailwind for the growth efficiency improvement in the next years, beginning probably with China, which is relatively far advanced, and then continue with other emerging economies. The other booster could come from the resource nexus, which is about these resource interlinkages. And again, it is related to one of the shortcomings, I would say, of measuring resource efficiency, which typically comes with comprehensive material flow analysis and indicators such as DMC and RMC, which are really not easy to do, but they focus on materials where they have a sub-indicator energy in it, one way or another, measured in tons, not in kilowatt hours, but they're not measuring water. And, well, I see Tommy Allen sitting here, and the water cave was mentioned here, so what would they expect from companies if they really go into a more comprehensive understanding of resource efficiency, like the steel company in Russia, realizing that they use 100 much the water, 100 many times the water compared to other steel factories, they would probably use less water, less energy, less other resources. So it would be a more comprehensive understanding of resource efficiency, not necessarily following the traditional indicator, but looking at the obvious, the interlinkages of using resources and what can be done there, which is certainly also along the lines of circular economy, at least in a more contemporary understanding and not looking for indicators first that had been developed 10 years ago, but looking to develop new type of indicators. So again, we would think this could well be a booster for resource efficiency in the long run and for a number of uh, countries and companies. Would it have the potential losers? <coughs> there was a big stone that was thrown into the water, the deep water by Florian at the end. Uh, in my chapter, I look very briefly at steel and mining, and both, you would think, could well be potential losers because they are energy intensive. And who would think mining is the future under the new framework of a circular economy? I'm saying, well, there is a lot in it. We would think that indeed steel will become more resource efficient, but also that indeed we could imagine an entire world economy running on secondary steel, while the electricity for secondary steel is being produced by renewable energy. So it would be an entirely different setting for looking at steel. And with mining, it could also be at least similar and comparable in the sense of that mining indeed still is about getting stuff out of the ground and supplying it on the world market. But for a number of materials, we are likely to need more of them, like in cobalt. And indeed, mining itself could become much more energy and water efficient, much more resource efficient. And then hopefully, we could also think of new business models where materials can be leased. So mining companies could have a stake in the entire supply chain rather than being just involved in the primary extraction. I admit this requires lots of disruptive changes in the business model. And the current mindset is, I would say, not yet there, but the stores are on the table. But again, probably the main point here is that we could also expect disruptive changes within core industries, and some of them might be going in one direction, and some might be going in others. So we also look forward to the discussion. I encourage all of you to well, be with us here for some provoking questions. You will do also see it, not for me. And I look forward to the discussion. <coughs> thanks a lot, and thanks again for inviting me to make a contribution. Paul, so well. Thank you. Chapter focused on 
um, hopefully providing some positive examples of addressing what can seem like an enormous challenge when it comes to basically providing the resource needs for the world in the coming decades. So the International Resource Panel um, estimated that we extracted around 88 billion tons of resources in 2017. That amount is expected to double by 2060. So in order to get there, obviously a huge amount of investment is going to be necessary to both meet uh, global population demand and also an increase in global wealth that will be driving this demand for material consumption. So rather than start to freak out about necessarily how we're going to achieve this, we were hoping to provide some concrete examples, at least from our experience working in our region, being Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Northern Africa, of how emerging economies and uh, businesses, and mostly in the private sector, is able to start addressing some of their resource efficiency problems at a much more local and individual scale. Um, so without going into too much detail about our chapter, I just want to provide two examples of ways that um, financial institutions and other um, actors in the finance space are able to start approaching uh, resource efficiency investments in what we like to think is innovative ways uh, to address the specific problems and specific constraints or barriers that uh, uh, our client or a borrower might uh, have. So one of the examples we want to show um, would be in the case where um, a financial institution is able to provide only a certain size of a loan. Um, and this can come from, um, let's say, like a million dollars upward. But to be honest, a lot of the economy that we have is based in the SMB space. So they're not going to necessarily be able to have access to or need or have a need for capital of that size. So what are we able to do in order to, to basically provide the resource efficiency needs to SMEs that need uh, finance at a smaller scale. And one of the things that you can start to think about is have an institution, a large commercial bank based here in London, call it an IFI, call it an EBRD, whatever you want, um, can start looking at what has a more sort of local uh, connection to the SMEs on the ground. And what we do at the EBRD is partner with um, local financial institutions, what we call partner financial institutions, um, in our countries who are able to disperse finance um, at a much more micro level down to SMEs, individuals who need it, um, and basically borrowers who are able to work with them at a scale that our institution really is not. So what this is able to do is through a credit line to these PFIs, which is just basically one large loan that they're then going to manage, we're able then to go from 10 potential borrowers to thousands of potential borrowers and start to address what would be um, issues that we really do not have the capacity to take on. And then the other example I wanted to bring up was um, what if the borrower in question really doesn't have the capacity to even take on a loan. They're not credit worthy, they don't have a lot of experience in the technologies that you're, um, would be necessary in order to undertake resource efficiency. Um, and one of the things that we are trying to do is look at what are the sort of higher capacity clients within that region, often larger corporates or ones that have experience in, in servicing debt or taking on a loan or taking an equity stake. And one of the more innovative things that we did was um, in Turkey, uh, where the glass recycling market um, is one of the largest in the world. Um, we had a company that uh, had quite a few suppliers of their glass pellet, so basically um, the raw material that they need in order to produce their bottles. Um, those companies that were providing the collet, though, uh, weren't necessarily providing the highest quality collet. So what would end up happening is that there would be um, breakages on the on the glass company's line, or you'd have um, basically not as efficient a product as you would need. Um, so what we were able to do is starting out again at the IFI level or um, at a commercial bank level, we partnered with the um, local corporate, so a much larger body, and we provided a direct loan. This corporate then provided down to its uh, recycling suppliers, so we're providing the um, call it uh, the, the the financing that they needed, not a loan, but just the financing they needed to invest in higher uh, grade or state of the art recycling technologies. 
And instead of repaying the corporate directly through, um, obviously, a typical financial transaction, these recyclers repaid them through a contract that required them to provide a certain amount of glass pellet of a certain standard each year. The corporates, the corporate benefited by basically ensuring that it's going to have a high quality product, um, while the recyclers themselves, let's say it ends up being about 90% of their product is going to the corporate, the other 10% is able to go off into the market. And since it's such a high quality product, they're able to sell it for much more than they were before. So you have profit at the lowest level, at the corporate level, and at the EBRDs level. And without going too much more into these other details, I think that as part of our discussion, and I'm happy to bring up other examples, um, the lesson to learn here is that resource efficiency, when it comes to financing it, there are so many barriers that you might come across um, when it comes to the, the client. But if you can start to address really what the barrier is and why the client has that issue, you can start to come up with, with our innovative or um, appropriate financing solutions to have them um, I guess address their issues and be able to finance the resource efficient technologies that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. So thanks. Anyway, looking forward to the discussion. I'm just going to flip back a couple of slides. So I'm going to get this out of the way. That's all right. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to uh, Florian's policy slides because uh, that more or less means that I can sit down without saying anything, which is very nice. Um, but I'm just going to amplify uh, a little bit of that. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on resource efficiency. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague Nick Hughes, who's helped me uh, very much with that, both for the International Resource Panel and produced a report on resource efficiency for them. For the UK government, we produced the policy chapter on their recent Managing Resources publication. Um, and the way I conceptualise the problem is that resource efficiency is too often in conflict with economic efficiency as defined by current markets. Um, John gave some of the reasons for that uh, right at the beginning uh, in terms of things like price volatility, resource insecurity, and of course the externalities associated with, re with resource extraction don't get into the prices in the first place, but also um, the mismatch between resource costs and labor costs very often mean that it is economically efficient to use more resources and less labor, um, even though it would be socially beneficial to use more labor and less resources. So the, 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 the policy problem is really trying to address those issues there are lots of concepts about uh, as to how one might do that and how one might, again, conceptualize the problem. Uh, at the European level, obviously, we've got the waste hierarchy. Uh, very fashionable at the moment is the circular economy. Uh, we've also got the resource efficiency idea, which is the subject of this book. Um, in the chapter, we go through those concepts, what they mean, and whether or not we think they're going to be effective. And then we identify the various things that need to be done by policy in order to close the gap between um, potential resource efficiency that would be cost effective and indeed um, the, the, uh, the current situation. Issues like the lack of information, like financial risk, like the transaction costs, split information, the pricing of externalities, risk perception, um, market creation uh, and uh, the scope for public procurement. The good news about this is that there is an enormous amount of experience in OECD and other countries about how to do these things. We know how to do them. Um, the market uh, generates a certain amount of resource efficiency each year by itself, but as I say, not enough. And uh, there are in different countries very good examples of very creative ways of getting around all those issues. Uh, the UK has contributed to that, so we set up the first national industrial symbiosis program in the world, uh, which was saving large uh, quantities of uh, environmental impacts, as well as giving very significant economic benefits to, um, to 
re repaying the Treasury threefold for the money that the public sector had invested. And um, we're saving carbon at a rate of about three pence a tonne. Three pence a tonne. So quite extraordinary efficiencies coming out of, of that. Um, other examples in Sweden, uh, they've reduced the rate of VAT on repairing small uh, appliances. Uh, we've all had the experience of having to throw stuff away, which we think is perfectly good, but it's just stuff that we are not able to repair. So they've reduced the VAT on that to try to bring labor costs and resource costs a little more into balance. Um, Florian mentioned the landfill tax. Uh, one of my favorites is, is, the extens is the extended producer responsibility legislation. Um, whereby uh, conventional responsibility for waste is, uh, lies with the consumer uh, who buy the stuff. They have not got the incentive or the knowledge to deal with this stuff properly. Um, extended producer responsibility takes the responsibility to producers to cope with the end of life of the product. And immediately you get incentives uh, into the system uh, in order for the uh, product to be much better designed so that the materials can be much more easily reused. Um, and indeed, uh, you, invent, you, you would then also have incentives created for consumers to return the materials to producers. As I say, many of these policies exist in embryo, uh, and sometimes in much more than embryo, um, but uh, we've still got an enormous way to go if we're to move towards anything resembling a circular economy, zero waste, or any of the other formulations that are sometimes talked about. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, I, I, I commend the book to you. I think it probably is a state-of-the-art publication on where we are with thinking about resources and uh, looking forward very much to the discussion uh, that uh, is going to come, come now. So let's have some, some questions, please, or some comments uh, if you feel you'd like to contribute something. If you'd like to introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll uh, know who we are. Andrew Ross from Global Carbon. There hasn't been a mention of the role of cities in this. They are the fulcrum of development globally for more than 50% of the world's population. And at the same time, the green bond market is desperate to find projects that provide a scale of investable proposition such as cities can generate. That isn't my question. The question revolves around water that has been mentioned, which is, of course, absolutely fundamental to the entire industrial enterprise and to life on that, and the mispricing of water. Is there a way in your thinking that you can see how to reprice water Distribution of green bond financing through cities. Um, so we did. So actually, some of the very early work that we did together with the EBRD was about uh, looking at different resources, including water, and um, trying to figure out what are the the costs of saving these resources. So it was materials, energy, and water, and the question of how to price types of resources and it was pretty straightforward as you mentioned uh, for energy and materials. Um, water was the big challenge you know you rightfully point that out. What we so we worked on various um, projects trying to price and measure the uh, cost of water or the benefit of saving water and what we found was first of all it's completely overused especially in those places where it's not priced. Um, and the places where water is priced tend to be the uh, places that are very water scarce. So, for instance, um, we looked at a project in Jordan where uh, water scarcity is a huge issue, um, and several countries in that region actually water, a lot of it comes from desalination. So there is quite a, um, there is a concrete cost associated with, with desalination. It gets much more difficult when you start talking naturally uh, groundwater or other um, surface water sources. And the, yeah, so the, the question really that we tried to address was to 
how to price this, and in the case of water, I think it is to some extent an open question. So in the, in the cases that we looked at, 20 investment projects, for several we were able to do it because of the uh, exact way that water was sourced. So it was either the uh, extraction cost, desalination cost, but in some cases it was not possible because either the local authority was not even trying to regulate the water supply um, or firms were simply extracting water from wherever it was um, available nearby and the efficiency gain in those contexts we had to basically ignore because uh, we had to err on the side of uh, conservatism or caution to say that the benefit of saving water in this, so the resource efficiency gain of a given project in this case we should underestimate rather than trying to put a very rough number on the water savings um, and running the risk of overestimating it. So my question is, isn't this a great opportunity for municipal green bonds? Um, can you expand a bit on what you, what, what would that look like? A city bond, but then all the corporates who depend on the water would invest in under the Financial Stability Board Task Force on Climate Data Disclosure, where they have to disclose their vulnerability to climate change to their investors, and thereby they could be investing directly in a municipal bond that is conserving the very asset on which they fundamentally depend. Um, so, yes. Of course, and so we have, ah. but the, so one point out that we encounter with these policy issues over and over is, the, is simply the political. So there is the economic optimality and feasibility versus the political feasibility, and that's the trade-off that we encounter with all the projects we look at. It's the money that talks. Well, so it's not only the the financing. I think when we look at where the water scarce areas are as well. And in terms of which of those areas would be even able to issue a municipal bond, um, the one that immediately comes to mind would be cities in South Africa. Uh, when it comes to cities in Northern Africa, having the capacity to issue, track, and appropriately assess a green bond, especially when it comes to the environmental reporting um, needs that, that come with that type of instrument, aren't really in place. So I think. The uh, I guess situation that you presented would be I guess the most advanced option, and certainly something that uh, could become a model for other cities to pursue. Um, but in terms of capacity at the moment to even get to a bond issuance, let alone a green bond issu issuance, is something that we work on in general um, within our debt markets within sort of at least the EDRD region, which has quite a few water scarce countries. Good. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, good idea, Andrew, but uh, not feasible everywhere. Seems to be the answer to that. Gentleman at the back. I'm Gregory Parker, the Renewable Energy Consultant. Um, the Energy Transition Commission, which is a group of business, business leaders led by Adair Turner, has just produced a report on the decarbonisation of hard to treat areas like steel, concrete, and heavy transport. And they come to the conclusion that these areas, all of them, not just those, can be decarbonized at relatively low cost. So they're talking about less than half a percent of GDP by 2050. And Raymond was talking earlier about coal bonds, uh, which is, of course, central for batteries, for electric cars. And the Transition Commission talk about an enormous new investment which is necessary in electrification. So there's going to be a vast new energy uh, network involved. And that will, of course, involve enormous amounts of new cars and all the rest of it. There seems to be a policy space missing at the moment for an equivalent tr commission for resources. So business gets its head around these things, which is far from an academic issue. Do you want to comment on that? Sounds great, yes. Uh, Certainly, I mean, there's a lot being done on the energy side, and, and I mean, uh, we, it's also, frankly speaking, just uh, we, we have better data, and, and it has been longer around, and uh, it has uh, uh, seen much more attention compared to uh, much more resources, but as Ryan exactly pointed out, I mean, they're all interrelated. Um, 
there is a lot of uh, international work. I mean, the International Resource Panel, of course, is, is an important player. The Alan MacArthur Foundation, of course, uh, brought the, the whole issue of circular economy uh, very well to the table for firms and so on. But um, OECD does, of course, a lot of work on this. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, yes, I agree with you that uh, there needs to be uh, much more being done in terms of understanding exactly these type of transitions. Uh, so the issues that I described as well, that uh, you know, they're not just about uh, commercial viability, but uh, there's environmental issues and social issues as well involved. So um, yeah, I think, I think the issue is that um, there are lots of bits and pieces, uh, but they're not being put together uh, to the extent possible. Um, and that uh, people have to become more aware that it's not just energy, right? Uh, that we're here talking about much more uh, resources than just energy. Uh, energy being important, I'm not trying to question that, but um, uh, I think a more holistic approach uh, is needed. Yes. Brian, if you look as if you want to make a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> I could just quickly add to this fascinating discussion. We often look at energy in terms of companies, and indeed when we take a closer look, we realize that indeed their competitiveness pressure in the past has already been relatively high, meaning they can credibly argue that they were more or less uh, already close to the efficiency frontier. Does this mean there is nothing more to do? I would say yes, but it comes very much with a life cycle type of an approach, meaning that we would need to look at where would the resources come from that these energy intensive companies use, like iron ore mining or steel companies, plus indeed the application of those materials. And this is where you then the weight of the vehicles or the sort of design for construction comes into play, which is not really influenced strongly by those suppliers, but where then the policies come in. So you would need to have like eco design standards for vehicles that are more comprehensive than just looking at carbon. They would need to include resource efficiency, circular economy principles to eco design in a way. Plus, indeed, then the whole life cycle of reusing the material that has been done. So the life cycle perspective of how to look at applying those materials downstream, that's to me quite essential in moving forward on the uh, resource efficiency. Good. Thank you very much for that, Leon. Uh, any other questions or comments to come out from today? Yes. Where does geopolitics come in? Geopolitics, because you have a lot of the materials that are completely unstable areas, not just cobalt, oil. Uh, have you looked into that? Whether something can be done on that front? So, I, I mean, the uh, June alluded to that, uh, of course, that uh, the supplies, uh, you know, basically, it's not that we're going to run out of certain uh, materials, but uh, the access to them might be disrupted. Uh, especially in um, supply chains the way we have them at the moment. They're very globalized, very fragile. Um, so that's actually also one of the reasons why um, uh, particularly uh, uh, European countries, for example, but OECD countries more generally, uh, look into this type of issue as well in terms of recycling and the circular economy also to basically counterbalance uh, uh, potential uh, supply, supply uh, disruptions uh, by uh, becoming self-sufficient, so in, in, in that sense. And um, and that clearly has an implication then uh, from a geopolitical perspective as well. Um, it's not the focus of the book, uh, but it's clearly one of the reasons why this agenda uh, also features, uh, features highly. Um, and uh, that, of course, has a lot of uh, additional downstream implications as well, uh, clearly, yeah. It just seems to be that new technology of the newest and most advanced technologies seem to demand materials which are in politically unstable areas? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, to, yes, uh, to, to some degree they or are. Or maybe they become and unstable because of that, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe if I can just come back to the example that I mentioned of the DRC. Um, the, so cobalt will, be, will continue to be extremely important and the demand for it will increase. Uh, resource efficiency is usually presented as a hedge to making sure we are not overexposed to these geopolitical supply risks. Um, but Raymond mentioned it, we can probably not uh, get into a situation where all the increasing uh, 
uh, demand for uh, rechargeable batteries out from secondary sources of resources. There will always be some mm -hmm. level of exposure, and so we are looking at resource efficiency as a hedge against these risks, but um, we are not suggesting that these can be eliminated or that you can uh, get, uh, yeah, get away from that. Um, I think it's also important in this debate to look at where the drivers come from. You're absolutely right that, say, low-carbon technologies need a lot of non-renewable resources, and some of them are critical. But it's the same, if not even stronger, for a more fossil fuel-based development. So there's clear acknowledgement that all comes from uh, some of the most um, brutal dictatorships in the world, and indeed also some very fragile areas. So more carbon-intensive development very likely keeps on liaising with some of those uh, instable regions dependency on dictators, etc. And what I find important is that some of the countries that now start developing their own agenda for extraction and are looking towards Central Asia, they really have a number of options in that they could <coughs> start exploiting fossil fuels or mining or both. And probably in the long run they would be slightly better off if they took advantages of mining critical materials that might go into zone development rather than fossil fuel alone, and indeed do it in a way with like renewable energy supply that they would become more diversified and more stable. But I admit this is a bit like a, a development pathway type of analysis that still requires further thought. I just wanted to make the point that the fragility is indeed not mainly driven by demand from low carbon technology or resource efficiency, but also from a very, very traditional type of development. And it, it's also not inevitable in the sense, and I'll uh, give a little plug to uh, an upcoming report from the International Resource Panel, which I'm one of the authors of, on resource governance. So the way in which we mine uh, is subject in many countries to very considerable controls and governance issues, and there is a very active agenda uh, right across the world, whether we're talking about diamonds or whether we're talking about cobalt, whether we're talking about conflict minerals of other kinds, actually to put in place governance mechanisms that will ensure that these materials are extracted in a more socially and environmentally beneficial way, in ways that will strengthen the government, the, the governance of the countries in which they're there, rather than serve to undermine them. So that's a very important part of the agenda which relates to some of this. Well, when you look at the big mining companies, they have, of course, huge political influence, and they're mostly Western. So, I mean, there is probably some way to make progress. Well, and indeed, a lot of progress has been made. If you look at the ICMN, there's a lot of uh, progress there. <coughs> Any more questions that people want to ask? Because uh, otherwise, we're going to bring it to a close. But Paul, uh, could, you, could you just expand on that? Because you just hit on the very point, like this mapping of the resource deficit across the planet exactly correlates with the political deficiencies, whether it's from China to Brazil. You can map it absolutely directly. So the political problem is at the heart of this, isn't it? Well, politics tends to be at the heart of practically everything. Well, what's your solution then? Well, the solution is to strengthen governance. Is to strengthen How do you governance. That? Well, bodies like the World Bank have very, very strong governance development programs. You increase the capability in the countries, you try to support um, more democratic processes as opposed to less democratic processes. You make aid contingent on the uh, observance of basic human rights and all that kind of stuff. No one's saying it's easy, and we can only look at the world and know that it's very difficult. But nevertheless, in some places, at some points in time, there is progress. And it's definitely worth trying. I'm going to take one more question there, and then we're going to uh, say we're on some media higher stuff. Um, my question is around kind of circular economy and the front end resource efficiency seems to be, a lot of the gains uh, mentioned, seem to be uh, already done. Uh, if, you, if you're carpet manufacturing on a reduced amount of water, it makes sense to keep costs low. But there's not much economic incentive to go and then collect those carpets that you put into the marketplace and revalorize them, right? So are there any realistic policy changes that could 
I say extended for you to liability. So any any kind of exciting politics you mentioned might interest me. So generally, there's a lot in the book. So please read there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but generally, you know, I mean, uh, we are not reinventing the wheel here, right? I mean, we see that yes, the low hanging fruits basically are taken. However, there are barriers that we describe very much in detail. Uh, there's a lot policy can do. There's a lot uh, that NDDs can do um, to showcase it. It's, it's a lot about information and so on, but it's also about really hard uh, policy. Uh, so a, a necessary condition, and it's, it's nowhere sufficient, of course, is something like a carbon price, a binding carbon price. Um, of course, as I said, this is not sufficient. There's much more needed than that. Um, but importantly as well is that in all these developments, uh, you clearly have a certain path dependency. So what you invest now and what you do now has implications later on, right? So, um, in, and I mean, Paul, actually, uh, this is a paper that uh, you were involved in quite a bit, is how much investments in, in infrastructure is being done at the moment and, and what that means in the future. So, um, I think it's not a silver bullet. Uh, in terms of policies, what can be done, but it's really these policy mixes uh, that, uh, that have to take into account all these considerations uh, that we try to map. So um, I think, yeah, if you want and to. I would like to come back to the first part of your question and challenge you a bit on that. Because you said the front end efficiency gains have all been reaped, and it's all a question of the looping it back in. You said it's stronger than I did, but um, okay. <laughs> so <coughs> I showed you the case of Russia. And what we see is that there are so many opportunities to invest in resource efficiency, um, and it would make perfect commercial sense. However, we simply don't, do not see it happening. So we still see these efficiency gaps, especially in middle and low-income countries. So what we looked at is really how do you make sure we get over these these barriers in order to make sure that these theoretically, apparently, uh, commercially viable resource efficiency investments actually get done. Uh, because in so many cases, it, they don't get done. And in the case of energy efficiency, that has been uh, looked at extensively. Um, so why do firms not change their light bulbs to LED when it's apparently so much cheaper? It's not happening. So what are the barriers? And that's really a whole space that hasn't really been looked at in the wider material and resource uh, efficiencies um, question. So that's so it's all in the book. <laughs> well, that's a very good place to finish, read the book. I was expecting some kind of, because uh, two commercially minded young men here, expecting some kind of message of that kind. Um, yeah, I mean, quite apart from, I think it's a, it's a useful, very useful contribution to the area, and uh, a huge congratulations to you both for having produced that, more or less at the same time as your PhDs, which in Jung's case, at any rate, was in a completely different area um, from, this, uh, from the subject of this book. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. We enjoy it very much.